with over 400 celebrity interviews and tons of pop culture nerdiness, Too Opinionated is a safe haven for your inner geek. Find us at MeisterCon.com or on YouTube under MeisterCon Pod. And please subscribe. It would really help us out. Thanks, everybody. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Two Opinionated. I'm really excited today. I've got the writer-director for the new documentary, A Pebble in the Pond, Paul Howard, with me. So welcome, Paul. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I'm so excited to, to talk with you because I think this uh, documentary is so interesting and so uplifting. It's, it's you know, we're, we're, we're kind of in that situation now where we're looking for positive things to watch and to do, and this documentary definitely fits the bill. I love that. And, yeah, I think that's – I absolutely agree. It's one of the reasons we did it is I've always believed that – not only is there more good out there than bad, but that people want that. I think we sometimes forget with, you know, media and news the way it is, but people want to hear these stories. And why wouldn't you, (laughs) you know? Yeah. Why wouldn't you? It's a, it's, it's a nice uh, emotional journey, but ends positive. So, so you, you, you walk away from the viewing feeling good and wanting to help people, which I think is a, is a nice bonus. Yeah. I, I think I always say to people, it may make you cry, but it's not like tears of devastation. Right. It's a bit more of like tears of joy or it's cathartic because you learn about inspiring people. You learn about people who maybe suffered or were challenged, but like, transcended that or have grown to now give back to others. And I just think it's, yeah, it's, it's how I kind of live my life too, with this belief that people um, that we want to inherently do good or that we at least want to just get along. I don't, I don't think everyone is, you know, out to be extraordinary, <laughs> but I definitely think that, you know, live and let live, I think is most people's motto. Yeah. Um, but I think we've just become so, the nature of the beast, you know, with media and Twitter and all those things, it just is like, of course, the more, more dramatic thing is what gets amplified. But there's so many people doing such good stuff all the time and have been for years, decades. And I just think it, I really want to remind people of that. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So so we got to talk a lot about the documentary. But before we do, you know, tell me a little bit about what got you into the entertainment business. You know, what made you want to go into this line of work? Sure. I have always liked telling stories. I think that's something that always yeah. interested me. And I started um, primarily as an actor. I um, I got, it's kind of a fun little side story. I was in an art class in seventh grade, which I loved. And I'm a horrible horrible artist. Like I can't draw to save my life. I can't paint. Like I'm really, really bad, but I loved it. And I mostly think I loved it because the teacher, she was so, I don't know, just so supportive and inspiring. And I just really connected to her. And like a week into the class, my schedule was changed randomly, which happens sometimes. And so all of my classes were changed. Well, for like a seventh grader, that's, you know, devastating. Yeah. Already. Yeah. yeah. That's but stressful. Then, most importantly, I was taken out of art class and put into drama. And I'm like, no way. You know what I mean? Like I, I was, it was terrifying, you know, to like have to, at that age, you know, think about going up on stage or performing or talking in front of people even. Right. So, well, I got into that class and, you know, it, I think it really put me on the path that I am on today because that drama teacher was just the cliche example of a teacher that affects a child's life and changes them. And she was such an amazing spirit. I met one of my dearest friends at the time and, um, you know, really just grew and, and became more confident as kind of a, as a person, I would say first, and then you, you start performing and so through high school, I was very involved, um, in performing and directing and, singing and choreographing and acting and all the whole thing. And then I went to college. I went to a two year uh, college in Stockton, California, that was uh, an audition based program that gave a lot of background on kind of 
wardrobe and sets and lighting nice. and things that was beyond what actors I think really kind of get. And so that was great because it developed a lot of those other skills that I think I had, but didn't realize. And many right. times actors just stand there, look good, or, you know, learn your lines and that's pretty much it. So from there, I transferred to UC Irvine and uh, got my degree in drama and also had great experiences there. But I think after getting into the industry as an actor, it can be, and people can definitely relate to what I'm about to say, it can be very disheartening and right. exhausting and frustrating and enraging. And, you know, because for me, my experience was so often you're a number, so often you are just like barely holding on between gigs and like, oh, right. great, I got this thing. And, you know, and you hold on to that for like <laughs> eight months later, you know, I'm still holding on to that one thing. And I just kind of felt like this isn't, this isn't all that I am. And uh, there's more that I want to do. There's more that I want to say and and tell. And so I started creating kind of content just really with friends and like, let's, I mean, again, professional, but really like just using my resources, like, Hey, you want to do this thing with us? And, you know, getting people to work <laughs> free largely and just, you know, doing what we could do. And so I created, you know, lots of shorts and really kind of fine tuned, I think, telling stories and um, stories that I cared about that were mine. Um, which led to eventually the Ann Ass series, which I did a docu series with Ann Benson, yeah, and and that series is about similar to a pebble in the pond, shining light on individuals or organizations doing good work, and from there I was introduced to the Assistance League, which really got the ball rolling for a pebble in the pond. So. I think it's been an interesting journey, not the one if you'd asked me five, 10 years ago, you know what I would have said, but I'm, I'm grateful for all of it. And I'm happy to be where I, where I am now. And I love that you kind of, I guess there's no other way to think about it, but you would have had to have gone through all those things to get to where you are now. So it's been certainly an interesting roundabout up and down journey, but the whole time I felt like I've um, been evolving and learning and connecting and spreading what I believe, you know, is, is my, my belief, my faith, my, you know, belief in humanity and what we're capable of. And so this is, this film is kind of the accumulation of a lot of that. And I feel really honored to have the reactions that people are having and really look forward to the future, because I think it's a very grassroots kind of you know, situation. It's not a Hollywood endorsed film or like, Hey, it comes out on the weekend and then the box office totals and you're done. Like we get to really, <laughs> you know, and those are great too. I love Hollywood films, but you know, this is not that this is very much grassroots and just trying to impact and affect people um, in real ways and then seeing what they do with that, which is exciting to me too. Yeah. I, I, I love that. And I like the fact that, you know, as you were kind of going through school and, and learning these different skills, I mean, you may have thought you were heading in one direction, but it's like you were learning all these different elements that you would need in order to, to do a documentary. Absolutely. And I think coming from the theater, specifically, theater actors have more of a sense of what else is happening because often you are doing those things. You do your own makeup or you do your own hair, or your costumes. Often you don't have kind of a team working with you to create you. It's very grassroots. You know, you, you go in, yeah. you do your makeup, you get into character, you kind of get your costume ready, your props ready. And depending on kind of the budget and the production level, you could be doing everything. You could be helping with lighting, you know, I mean, um, and so, yeah, I think it is interesting because I didn't have that thought necessarily as I was like striving to be an actor only. Um, uh, but now looking back, it's like, oh yeah, these things all helped kind of develop me as a storyteller, but also as a, as a human, you know, as just a person. Right. Learning. Yeah. And when you mentioned, uh, choreography, I mean, did you dance at that time? Yep. Yeah. Yes. I, uh. Well, the training program 
uh, at Stockton didn't really involve musical theater, but the one in Irvine did. And I went to New York and I lived there for um, like a month training program where we yeah. auditioned in New York and we worked with choreographers and teachers and we did acting classes and all of that too. But we did singing and like I had to get up at like 7 a.m. for ballet class. And I was never, you know, I was very clear ballet was never my thing. I never wanted to be a dancer per se. Right. I have deep respect for that, but that's a lot of uh, work and physicality you have to be really kind of dialed into. But I wanted to have kind of a, a base level of understanding and have certain skills. And I've always loved music. Um, again, these things are great reference points because in my film, you know, it's like I, I care very much about all of these different departments. And so music is very important to me. And mu the music of the film, you know, that I got to work with uh, Eric, our composer, was, you know, such a fun experience. And I think all of this background gives you more insight into kind of collaborating, knowing what you want, what you want to achieve, but also knowing when you allow people to do what they do best and bring that to the project. Yeah, I, I, uh, the the musical side of films, documentaries, and you know anything entertainment, it's it's a side that I think gets overlooked sometimes to to the detriment of the project. So it's so important, I think, to to have somebody that's able to to match up the music with the mood of whatever it is you're putting out there because it can really convey you know, the feelings that you're wanting to convey. And some things don't do a very good job of that. Absolutely. A great example, when Stranger Things first came out, it was like literally when it was first released, it's hard to remember now because it's such a phenomenon. But I watched the first, I think there's a few, it's like a few minutes before it goes to the title sequence with the Stranger Things. It's become iconic in that music. And I was sold in that moment. When the music hit yeah. and that graphic started, I liked what I had been seeing, but that was the moment I was like, this is a awesome. Yeah. I'm going to watch this show. And I love I think it. a lot of us felt that way. It was because so, the music was so perfectly a part of that project. And I think it's just a great example to illustrate what you're saying, that it matters. You know, all these components matter. And look, I, you know, everyone has to go about their projects their own way. But for me, I always want to collaborate and I always want everyone to feel like they're important and all of us need to work together because I come from the theater. We need the lights. Right. If they're not on. Then we don't, if we don't have the costumes. If we don't have, you know, you need it all. And so I think I really care about that. And with this film, I got to even do animation, which opens a whole other wow. door of stuff that I, I love it. You know I mean? I love just being able to tell stories in dynamic ways and working and collaborating with people who are, super talented in their industries and in what they do. I, I see it as very collaborative. I think, again, it comes from my theater background is I don't, it's not a competition. We're all working together to make right. the best project we can make. And certainly you have to have vision and, and somebody has to like kind of lead or direct the ship, if you will. But um, I really want input and that makes my project and anything I work on better because I'm getting input from all these people who this is what they do. Yeah, I, I'm really interested in that because I, I've talked to a lot of different uh, directors and I don't often hear them say uh, collaboration with that. And I'm sure that they do. Of course. But, but I think that's really interesting that, that that's kind of the first thing that you bring up and i love that example because you know you're kind of the the captain of the ship but you're not going anywhere if you don't have everybody pulling in the right direction absolutely and the bigger analogy to get because this is how i think and talk is this is an indication of society too is we all contribute like we all have to right. be a part of a functioning government democracy society whatever you want to call it neighborhood like we all contribute and I think there's a disconnect, you know, and I don't, there's a plethora of reasons, but the idea of collaboration, but also acknowledging that you're not the best at everything. I think that's right. a strange online phenomenon. I'll be the first to say I'm good at a lot of stuff and I'm like proud of my accomplishments, but do I think I know everything? Do I think I'm the best at everything? That's weird to me. And I just think it's like, 
let's be honest. I, I make yeah. mistakes and through a pebble in the pond, which is like literally what I'm promoting right now. I would also say I've, I would do a lot of things differently. I've learned a lot of stuff. I don't see that as some sort of disqualification to the film, to myself. It's just a, I would hope kind of the, the way it should be is I'm like, okay, I did it. This was the first time I did a lot of right. things. I would do it differently, you know? Yeah, I, I love that. I think that's terrific. So so how did you and um, Anne get together? How did you meet? So Anne auditioned one of those short films I was doing um, yeah. during that process. She auditioned for me. And funny enough, she loves to tell the story. Um, she, I didn't cast her. Um, I, it was between her and another woman and I, I loved her so much, but I didn't end up casting her. The other woman was amazing also and was more appropriate for the role. Right. But after I finished, I, I couldn't let it go. There was such a connection between Anne and I, which again, I find so fascinating about society. We don't, we don't talk about, you know, we talk about love relationships. I met my husband or wife, you know, and like we talk right. about those but people connect in all sorts of profound and interesting dynamic ways. And there was just a connection. I just was drawn to her. And so I wrote a part, like I added a part to this like a little offshoot of the short. And I, I actually talked to the one of the producers on the film um, and said, you know, I want to offer this, but do you think she'll think that's weird? You know, or like, that's like, I'm giving her a, another role she didn't audition for. It's like, well, you know, ask her, let her decide. So I called her and she was super, super gracious as she is, was delighted to do it. And we just started collaborating from that point on. I, I used her in multiple things. We um, I used to do Christmas cards every year um, that were like high production value Christmas cards. And she was one of my, she was in one of my Christmas cards. I mean, we just, she, we just started collaborating. And so I kind of wanted to do a project with her. And so I went to, we had a, a sushi lunch um, set up and I met with her and in my head, I was like, okay, she had done off their rockers, Betty White's off their rockers. Oh, yeah. And so she's comedian, she's hilarious. And so I thought, okay, I want to do something funny. Like, you know, I, was, I had this whole pitch in my idea and I hadn't even really got to it. And she's like, you know what? I'm happy to work with you. I'm, I want to do whatever. I just don't want to do like comedy. And I'm like, okay so it's like i immediately had to transition i'm like no that makes sense let's uh but we started talking and we were interested in very similar things we had a similar outlook and that kind of developed an ass um but yeah we met at an audition <laughs> yeah I, I love it I, I think she's such a a talented actress you know i, I remember seeing her on uh, mad men um scorpion I think yeah. is the is the show, and she was really uh, really good on both those, and of course the the uh, Betty White show, um, the, the the that was just terrific with that, and it was kind of a, if I remember right, it was kind of um, it was like a prank show. Yeah, it was like yeah. seniors um, basically play pranks on younger people, and it's yeah. like I mean she's the, the most it's amazing funny. To do that. It's fun. It's a really fun show. Yeah, it's really it, yeah, it's really good. Um, so when when I was prepping to get ready for, for this interview, I saw that, that she was part of it. And I was like, Oh, I know her, you know, I've seen her and she's you know, really talented. So I, so I wanted to mention that, but let's yeah. talk about a pebble in the pond. Sure. You know, what's the documentary about and what drew you to the project? So uh, a pebble in the pond, I like to say is about a nonprofit that has existed for over 125 years called the assistance league. And yeah. specifically their signature program, Operation School Bell, which provides school clothing, backpacks, shoes for children who are part of the foster system, low income, or even sometimes homeless. And so the film is about the origins of the Assistance League, but also it kind of jumps back and forth between today and the impact that it is having right now on lives and then i think it's a larger theme it is about the full circle nature of if you help someone what happens um do they i think as some may believe become dependent or the need that help or do they as i have found become the helpers and then inspire others to help it is a it's like a reverse we always think about the negative cycles it's like a positive cycle you know it's like you help yeah. somebody and then they help somebody and then they help somebody yeah it's like paying it forward 
It's exactly, exactly. I think that's yes. probably the best example that we think of as a society that's a positive thing, but it's true. And so the film is, I, I, you know, it's a very joyful documentary. I love documentaries in general. Um, some of them can be really, really hard and, you know, and again, great. I'm glad people make some of them out there because I couldn't, you know, there's just right. so some of the content and subject matters are so challenging, but I love them. But sometimes you can just be kind of like, I can't, I can't watch a documentary tonight and <laughs> you know, it just feels too heavy. And this film is not that it's definitely, as we said, kind of at the beginning, you know, are, may there be tears? Sure. But it is, it's just, I feel like it's, it, you know, it's been great. It's, it's my film. So I think this way about it, but it just makes you feel hope and inspired yeah. and warmth and good. And I just, I think, it's it, saying all those things in a row immediately too is like, oh, that's cheesy, which is such a sad commentary on our society. But it's like, these are all things that why we all want those things. And so I think the film is, um, is all of that. And then it is a, it is a feeling, it is a mantra. It is, it is the altruistic application to looking at your life, your community, your neighborhood, and then asking the question, like, how can you help? Because I know that people get overwhelmed sometimes, but the idea isn't that you have to run for president or you have to found a nonprofit or you have to do something that we consider just epic and large. The idea can also be that, like, what are you doing in small ways that are also profound and important? So it's for everyone, and a reminder to all of us, including myself, of the things that we can do in our lives. And I really try to revel in that, you know, and remind myself, like, just, you know, give people like give assume the best, you know, like give them a moment yeah. and just go, OK, like, don't go to the worst because we all L.A. traffic. I live in L.A. <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean? We all go to the worst sometimes. But it's just that reminder of like, OK, maybe they're having a really bad day or maybe they didn't see you or maybe like just give people some have some grace. And um, and I feel and I feel better for it. So I can't speak for others. But having learned that and trying to live that more and more, it reminds me that it affects my life, too. My life is better. Right. For it. Yeah, I. I like it's the like my wife and I are just like everybody else that, you know, a lot of nights we're sitting in front of the TV having dinner and we kind of have this unspoken rule that we don't watch anything upsetting while we're eating, you know, <laughs> so that. it has to be something that's kind of feel good. And this would absolutely fit the bill. This would be one that we could watch while we were eating and feel and feel good about it. I love that. You don't want, you want, you want to have good digestion. You don't want that. That's things. it. That's it. Anything heavy, whatever it is, we wait till after we eat. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> did, um, did you come up with the name for the documentary? I did. I, I'm there. I'm a very, I'm a title guy. <laughs> I love titles. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, my process is like probably fascinating to other people. Like I just start like rolling around words in my head. And then I, with this one, I actually started writing a list because you can start to repeat yourself and kind of go on the sure. same. And I was like, eh. and so I just started writing them down. And it was funny because I get down to like the 15th one and I'm like, wait, that's the third one. You, know, you start <laughs> repeating yourself. Um, but a pebble in the pond, it just spoke to me. I thought it was an interesting title, but also so appropriate because a pebble is small and yet thrown into a pond is able to create a far reaching large ripple. And just right. taking that analogy one step further, if it is a large pond, those ripples go off into the distance and you don't always see what they touch or where they go. And that's been a huge, I think, breakthrough as going back to kind of artistry and my pro my career and my process in life is, you know, you don't always, I've been very fortunate to get so much great feedback and hear back about how I've impacted people or, or touched lives, but you don't always get that. And so, you know, I, I just think that's okay too, that we don't always know our effect on people or know how we've changed lives, but just keep doing the things that you do and keep trying to live um, in a way that is 
helpful or dynamic or creating ripples. Yes. Um, so yeah, that's the, the title was, a. Uh, it was not immediate. Like I was like, I, I like that title, but I'm not quite sure, but it, it definitely like I landed on it fairly quickly after. Yeah. I think you picked the right one. So, Cause as soon as I heard the title, I had a little bit of an idea of what type of documentary it was going to be. You know, it felt very positive, and that's exactly what you think of. You know, you throw a, a rock in a in a pond, and you see the the ripples going out, but you don't really see where they end. Yep, you just see them them going off. And I was like, oh, I I think I've got an idea what this is about, and that's exactly what it was about, which was really cool. <laughs> That's good. I love that. I do love hearing it. It's been it's been a fun process because you're with a film for I mean, it wasn't long in the scheme of Hollywood films, but, you know, you're with a film for we started filming in 2018, beginning of 2018. And then in end of 2019, we did a screening, which is astronomically yeah. fast for it's fast. Uh, for a documentary or any film, but uh, then I ended up cutting it. So the version that everyone has seen now is a shorter version of that thing that I screened. Um, but, you know, it was a fast process, even if you said, okay, started in 2018 and now 2020 it's out with a pandemic in the middle, you know, I mean, it's a pretty fast yeah. process, but you're with something for so long that sometimes you can be disconnected from like what it is and what people's perceptions are going to be. So it has been a really great process to kind of be able to get to hear. So like even you talking about what did the title communicate to you? That's cool because these are the things that I don't always get to hear. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought it was really great. So I know that, that the original organization was founded by, by one woman Are are any of her relatives still involved in the organization? Um, that's a good question. They are not to my knowledge, although there has been like cursory, like the Los Angeles chapter had a fundraiser, uh, like a hundredth celebration, which is interesting because the organization, it predates that, but I'm not quite sure how everyone, cause I did a lot of research, um, and dug into old newspapers. So yes, some of the family members have participated in those, fundraisers and events but yeah. i don't think that they're in um positions of like being a chair of a committee or right, they may right, be right. members to be honest but um i'm not they don't have leadership roles to my knowledge because the league's been around like early 1900s right yeah 125 years so um wow. and that's you know i can document that through newspapers that listed mrs hancock banning because you would never call her Ann Banning right. um, at that time. Um, it was her husband's name and then assistance league in the same sentence. Um, and that pre, you know, like in the film talks about um, it all predates and comes um, from her involvement. Initially uh, she did stuff with, because of the earthquake um, in San Francisco and then, but she was doing stuff a little bit before then even, I think that was really the catalyst for the, for the storytelling. That was kind of this catalyst that I focused on, but she was involved prior to that. Even she was doing things. So she started very young. That was the other thing I think that makes her dynamic and banning is that she doesn't come from money per se. Um, I think she married into it. I mean, certainly she, right. her family wasn't poor, but she married into wealth and her husband was very successful. And so, you know, there was nothing saying that she had to do all the stuff that she did, but I think she was just a very uh, dynamic, empathetic doer. And she just couldn't not, you know, I, I see, because look what she's put into motion. I, it's made, I'm excited because the film will also give her a spotlight. I feel like she is a forgotten American pioneer. Um, because so many things that we take for granted today, like the thrift shop model uh, for charity comes directly from her. And the Red wow. Cross itself acknowledges that their first Red Cross shop that did that, well, they have her handwritten notes about it. And so, you know, Ann Manning is very literally one of our, I think, pioneers. So I look forward to her getting some, maybe a little bit more due. Uh, yeah. Because she's she's kick-ass I always say that I'm like she's a kick-ass lady I mean it's like she did a lot of great stuff and she comes from privilege which is a very 
timely topic too. She certainly comes from privilege, but it was what she did with that privilege and that that privilege didn't define her. She didn't allow that to be all that she was. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. It's not the first time that I've, uh, I've heard that name, you know, so, so she's out there, but you don't hear enough about her. I mean, these, right. these are the type of people we should be talking about. Absolutely. And again, the value system of like, maybe we should talk about people who are like doing good things for people as opposed to people <laughs> who are like taking everything from people. I just, you yeah. know, it's, it's that syndrome. I, I get why it happens. You know, it's part of, it's part of just, I think it's human nature. It's that like accident on the side of the road. That's not me, but like people you're drawn to like, we have to look, we can't look away. And, right. and then you bring in consumerism and, you know, it's like, of course you're selling something. Like I get it. I'm not naive, but I guess my, I would reiterate, you can sell good things too. You can sell good news. You can sell inspiration. I mean, certainly we do in the self-help market. You know what I mean? Like there's all these examples of it, but for some reason, media, I feel like it's kind of behind on that. You know, it's like, yeah. And again, I like a, I like a sad documentary. I like a dramatic film. It's not, I'm not saying don't do those things. I'm just saying that there's the, there's the opportunity that people, I really sincerely believe that people would watch this kind of content regularly if yeah. it were available to them. Well, as, as a people, I can tell you we would. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so the, the Operation School Bell side of it, I think this, this is, to me, the best part because it's dealing with helping kids. You know, and, and I remember those days, you know, when, if you go to school and you're missing something for whatever reason, it's so stressful and it makes you feel disconnected, you know, from the rest of the, the group. And I love the fact that this is a way to, to help kids have the things that they need, just, just the bare minimum things to, to navigate through school, which is a very difficult time in life. Exactly. I think we show it really nicely in the film with kind of the, even the volunteers reactions to like children getting things that are all yes. theirs for the first time, you know, like this is your toothbrush. Like I've never had my own toothbrush or these are your panties or shoes that they've never had their own. Right. And that was, I think what struck Ann and I, when we first, we were invited to observe an operation school bell before we filmed it. This was a year prior basically to us filming and we, it might've been less than a year, but we, we witnessed a operation school bell in person. We were just there to observe. We weren't volunteering because it was important for us to kind of yeah. see what was happening. And both Anna and I had tears in our eyes because it's so overwhelming. I think the movie communicates it to some extent, but I got to tell you in person, it's a whole other thing because yeah. to be faced with these children, to see their shoes their shoes that they come in and then to see these brand new shoes put on them and to watch them just really brighten you know it's a, it's just such a, it's such a tangible real thing and you know i did the best i could to show it in the film but i really do think it's a cathartic experience that is something physical and real in real life but it was overwhelming. I mean, her and I both were like, at points I had to like step away because you just become overwhelmed by the emotion of like these yeah. kids and they're just their innocence and their joy. And you're like, you know, like I have to like catch myself and like take a breath. Cause I'm like, okay, um, you know, don't lose it in front of everybody, you know, cause it's just, it's, it's heavy, but yes, I think it then, and they speak about this too. It then, reflects on how they see themselves as you were saying if you're stressed about oh i don't have a backpack not only is there the logistics of i have to carry everything but there's the peer pressure of why don't you have a backpack right. and then there's all the internal stuff that kids have and so it helps them but then it also helps the families the the caregivers the parents because it's one less thing for them because so often they are also of a similar situation where they're just holding on or just getting by. And so it takes a little bit off of that. And I have to share this story. This is like a newer story. I was um, on LinkedIn and I've been connecting to, with people who are obviously involved with the Assistance League, but Target, which we present in the show too, there's Target nights. And so they have this at other um, 
different stores too, but we show a target night where you can go to target and the assistance league gives them a gift card to use at the store as opposed I love to that. Yeah, it's great. And this target, um, this gentleman was a, a target employee and he posted two pictures. He's like a, another successful assistance league event. He's not involved with the assistance league at all as a reminder to everyone listening. He's in a, a target employee. And in front of him, there's like a table of, like trick or treat candy and snacks and like Capri Suns. And I was so struck by the image because I know having gone to assistance league events, he did that. That target store decided to make it more special for the families yeah. and the kids. So not only are they going to get the backpacks and the, the gift card or shoes or buy whatever they need, they, and then they get this like treat and like it's just i just it's so these little gestures but it's so beautiful you know i mean that this guy was like i'm gonna make it more special or it compounds like they're doing good meaning the assistance league well i'm gonna help do good also and and so if i can give them little snacks and treats to make it more special i just think that's what's so beautiful about operation school bell and that it is specific to community, which is a kind of a larger theme, I would also say. The Assistance League is great and does, I think the thing it does the best, in my humble opinion, is that it is community-based. If there's an Assistance League in Los Angeles or an Assistance League in Las Vegas or an Assistance League in Santa Clarita or in Atlanta, no matter where they are, they're very specific to their community. And right. I think there's something great about this. Not a one size fits all. It's not like this is the program and everybody aligns to this, you know, we do this <laughs> one thing. They really cater towards what does their community need and how can we achieve it? And what does that look like? And I think that's probably good kind of across the board for everything is that we be specific to our communities. Like, how is it, how is it working in the community? It isn't necessarily like, we don't need to apply some a rule across the board. I think it's like, what does this community need and how can we serve that community and help them? What are they asking for? What do they need? As opposed to, this is what we have. We're going to give them these things or go in with kind of that attitude. So I think that's why I'm a believer ultimately in assistance league and operation school bell, because it certainly has all of that I've already spoken about, but it has that specific to the community that they are serving. And I love that mindset. And I think it's, I think it's a, a winning way to kind of move forward on all of the world's issues. It's like, how do we deal with things? Well, we start with, you know, the people who are being affected. We start with right. where it's happening and don't worry so much about like, well, how do we do it here? You know, who cares? <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, I, I really, yeah, I love Operation School Bell and having experienced it in person. And I certainly highly encourage anyone who has an assistance league in their, in their, in their city to volunteer. It is a, you know, an amazing experience to just kind of, be reminded of the power of very simple things because it's also not you know these people aren't being given you know a million dollars like it's that's right the thing too, is it's just like it's just like small acts of kindness yep yep yeah. and it's it's just beautiful to witness and then it can of course the kids you know what i mean you just see the kids and their their reactions are so unfiltered and uncensored that's a part of where the emotion comes from too is because they don't hide their joy watching them pick a book you know like something we take i think especially now like you know we're like who reads a book who has a physical book kids love books you know what i mean yeah. kids want a physical book not everything is on an ipad and so to stand in front of a table and get to look i remember as a kid going to book fairs and you know oh yeah like my mom buying me a book like but getting that feeling of being able to get to pick my own and get to decide which one is it that i want which color what's on the cover of it what interests me that's such a I don't know. It's such a forgotten thing. And it's such a little gesture. That's the other thing I love about the assistance league and operation school bell is there's choice. The kids get to pick what color shoes, or they get to pick what sort of, if there's a school uniform, obviously that's one thing, but they get to pick what color backpack they have. And I love that too. It's not a, yeah, they too. it's not an assembly line. Cause I think that could be the danger in something like an assistance league going wrong is it's an assembly line and every kid just gets in line and here's your backpack. Here's your backpack. Here's your shoes. Here's your sh And it's, it's not that way at all. They spend time with the kids. 
They ask them questions, they talk to them, they interact. And then this is the ripples, that kid goes home and whether he, sh he or she shares it with his parents or whether he just has that feeling, he sees the world through a different lens because of that day. And he may always remember that. And the proof is in some of the people we interview many years later who adamantly remember, you know, I'm thinking about Ryan, the NFL player, like he adamantly remembers Operation School Days when he was a kid. He's a grown man now and he remembers those days. Yeah, that was that was my next question is is I thought that it did, but you actually talked to to some of these kids once they were grown yep. and kind of talked about the experiences they had with Operation School Bell when they were younger. And I thought that was a really neat uh, part of the documentary. Yeah, I think it was important to, I really wanted to, diversity is important to me across the board. And so it was also important for me to show different stages so that we talk to volunteers, we talk to members, we talk to new members, we talk to members who have been there for a long time, we talk to people who are in the leadership, but then in the recipients, we talk about people who are currently receiving. We talk to people who received many years ago, or as you say, were literally children or now adults. I thought it was important because part of part of the film is a thesis too on like, can can I prove this idea of secular a ripple creates, you know, good creates more good and that people want to give back and again and again as i can say nothing was edited out people just do good you know they want to now do good the orthodontist who you know got got uh dental care who then became an orthodontist in part i mean he changed well, his profession he was like wanted he was going in to be a doctor he changed his profession because he was impacted and now as an orthodontist, as a successful orthodontist, he gives back to his community and helps his patients either discounting or whatever he does. But that idea of full circle, I think is such a powerful, and again, one of the stories I thought really struck me in the film is Missy was, when at the time that we were filming her was currently, her child was currently getting Operation School Bell and she was homeless at the time that we were filming, which we were not aware of. Um, in the moment that she shared that with us, but she has, she communicates, I think really articulately how she wants to help volunteer because right. she's been given to right then and there. She's not saying off in the distance, someday I will help people. She wants to help right now. And I just felt like, wow. You know what I mean? Like it was just that yeah. moment of like, we get so many things right, but wow, do we get some stuff really wrong? And it's this idea that like, why? you know, well, I, no, I don't think anyone would get that right on the test. Like if they were like, and the next thing she says is, I don't think anyone would have, got, I don't know if I would have gotten it right. You know, I mean, until she said it, it was like, whoa, you know, this is, yeah. this is profound. And this is amazing that people who are helped see that benefit more so maybe than the people who were never helped and then want to be the helpers. So it's, yeah, I it's inspiring that. to me as a as a human, but also as a filmmaker. It's a fun, it's a fun process. When when you got involved and you decided you were going to do this documentary, did you have any idea that it was going to affect you this profoundly? Um yes and no. Obviously, I had seen Operation School Bill, and as I described, you know, we were I was very emotional and I I was surprised. I mean, I am certainly a more empathetic, emotional person. I think in general, I would say as a fair <laughs> statement to the world listening. Um, but I just was not prepared for how profound these gestures are. And then I was further not prepared for how the children's responses were so unfiltered, uncensored. Like I am not a parent, I don't have children. So that was, I think, partly the surprise for me is just like, wow, to, they don't hide it. You know what I mean? It's just very clearly there on their face. They don't have to say it to you. They, you can just see it. And, yeah. and then the process, I think, you know, as you start to get into it, it was, it was, it was discovery too. I mean, I think part of the thing I would say is the film follows kind of an organic way Anne and I's discovery of things too. You know, I mean, obviously I have to tell a story in a film, but we 
we didn't have any idea about what even assistance league was. We knew operation school though. That's where we started. And right. so from that, it grew into like, well, what's this assistance league thing? And, you know, and what, and then I, as I said, did research about Ann Banning and really like being shocked. I kept like having to check myself. I'm like, no, this has to be somewhere online. Like somebody has to, and honestly, <laughs> search other than what the assistance league chapters have as their little like blip, you know, um, of text, there's really nothing on the internet about Ann Banning. And there's yeah, that's like, surprising. Husband. it's weird. And like I, on Wikipedia, I say this cause I'm, I'm trying to will this into existence on Wikipedia. She's not even listed. Assistance league is listed. They have their own clickable thing. Um, her father-in-law Phineas Banning is also because he was a big, big guy in LA and the Banning house still exists as a museum here. Right. But she's like a little, and so her name is on Wikipedia, but she doesn't have a clickable page. And I actually tried to submit Wikipedia is weird, or maybe I just don't know how to do it, but I tried to submit her and I like had documents that's like prove and stuff and they rejected it. And I'm like, why she should have her own page, you know? <laughs> so I'm going to keep throwing it out to everybody. Cause she, I think she's also on the red cross page because yeah. again, she was involved with the, um, the chair. Well, I think that's where I had heard about her was in, in association with the red cross. Okay. Yeah. So she's, she, her name comes up anecdotally in a couple of places, but she doesn't have her own page. And I'm like, that's weird. Right. <laughs> you know, and I would keep that's like weird. new information and the film doesn't even have, everything i mean I, I can't include everything you know so she if you don't get it from the film trust me she was a very dynamic kick-ass woman so it's like why why is there not more so i'm going to keep talking about it and i'm going to will it into existence I mean, and that is really strange i mean especially when you i mean there's people with wikipedia pages that probably don't need a wikipedia <laughs> probably <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. And I, I should, I should actually like do like a proper Google and figure out like, okay, how can I, cause I, I remember doing it at the time and thinking like, well, I want to get her on to Wikipedia. She deserved, this was before the film was even finished. You know, I was just like, this is cool. I want to, and I couldn't, couldn't figure it out. So um, again, maybe that, that'll be one of the things I work on or somebody will be listening <laughs> and they'll go do it. <laughs> so, so the film came out on the 13th of September. Correct. Where can we watch it? So uh, Pebble in the Pond is pretty much available on all streaming platforms that Video On Demand is offered. So iTunes, Apple TV, Amazon, YouTube, Xbox, uh, it's on Direct TV. You can access it through any of those or you can um, search a Pebble in the Pond and it will come up now of the avail available places that it can be seen. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's so exciting. And and thank you, Paul, for taking a little bit of time to talk about it because I love it. I think it's just the the best um, inspirational documentary that I've seen come along in a while, you know, and, and, and we're looking for those things. We really we talked about that at the beginning of this interview, but it's it's something that as a society, I, I really think we're starting to turn to where we want positive things. We want to be inspired to help other people. And we're looking for ways to do that. And this film's a great example of, of some of the small things we can do that, that have large effects. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And I, I agree with you. And I hope that is true and that we do see more because I want to watch these kinds of films, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. Be making them. I want to see this. You know, I want uh, while I'm eating dinner. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, so so Paul, a couple of things before we wrap up. You know, sure. is there anything else that you're that you're working on that you have planned that we can kind of keep an eye out? Um, I have a couple of projects that I've done some filming and developing on. Um, one is called 81 and is about the 81st high school reunion of um, some uh, some seniors, one who is my great aunt yeah. um, and a few other projects that I'm developing. But um, yeah, you know, I'm just going to keep, I think this is the thing is like now that I've done this, as I said at the beginning, you learn a lot of stuff along the way. And I'm like, okay, yeah. cool. I'm going to do this totally differently. <laughs> or I'm going to do this one a little bit more this way. So um, I'm excited to apply kind of what I've learned and to, be able to create more. I, I want to keep on uh, making things and telling stories. Yeah, I hope you do. This has just been terrific. Um, last thing before we wrap up, you know, where can we find you on social media? 
So most of it is listed under Get Paul Howard. Um, my website is getpaulhoward.com. Um, it was because, fun fact, Paul Howard wasn't available when I, paulhoward.com wasn't available when I tried to yeah. register way back in the day, by the way. So we did, I was like, okay, let's, there needs to be some fun, memorable. So it's Get Paul Howard. Um, but you can also access things through a pebble in the pond film.com, which is the film's website. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, uh, or if you typed in a pebble in the pond and Paul Howard, you'd probably be able to find me too. <laughs> yeah, it comes up. And if you put it in, it, it immediately comes up. Great. So that's, yeah, that's, that's pretty great. Well, thank you so much, Paul. This has been terrific. You got to come back when you get 81 finished up. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> 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 All right, you so much for having me. Oh, you're so welcome. Yeah, hold on one second. All right, so that was director, writer, Paul Howard. I hope you guys enjoyed that. And please do yourself a favor and check out A Pebble in the Pond. I guarantee you'll be inspired. You'll come away feeling uh, good and I don't know. I think you'll have a better feeling just about humanity as a as a whole, which is exactly the type of thing that we need right now. So definitely check that out. And I think it's important that we support these type of projects so that the people that be will know that we want more of that. So please do that. I know as a as a podcast, you know, our small part is we try to shine a light on these projects that are important and that maybe don't get highlighted the way that they should. So if we can help a little bit with that, you know, whether it's a project or a, a person, we want to do that. And, and I hope that we do. Thank you guys so much for tuning in, joining us again this week. You know, if you want to help this podcast specifically, you can do it a couple of ways. You can help us on our YouTube channel, MeisterCon Pod. All we ask is that you subscribe. It's free. Really does help us out. You know, if you're listening, wherever you listen to podcasts, subscribe. That uh, that really does help us out because we take those numbers. And then when we're soliciting guests, we can say this is what we can offer. This is the audience that we have that uh, that we can offer and it helps us to to bring those guests on the show so we unbelievably and i i mentioned this almost every podcast because i'm just amazed that we've gotten to this point we're closing in on 500 episodes i think today i'm posting episode 466 we normally post about four times a week so we're a couple months away from hitting uh, episode 500 I can't believe it. You know, I, I'm so grateful. And I've got to talk to so many wonderful, terrific, talented people. So thank you guys for uh, kind of joining me on this journey. It has been uh, a, just a privilege. And I'm so grateful. Um, appreciate you guys. Uh, please check out the website, MeisterCon.com. You can see all 466 episodes, audio and video on the website. You know, if we're doing anything in studio, like watching a pebble in the pond, if we're going on location, if we're covering a convention, all that will be on the website. And it even has just a terrific, fun, geeky blog that Brett writes. I mean, talk about a talented writer. He is exactly that. I know you'll enjoy that. And you can check that out on the website, MeisterCon.com. So until next time, bye, everybody.